as we delve into the history of the wild hog in America, we uncover a story that is both fascinating and complex. These animals, also known as feral pigs or wild boars, were not originally native to the United States. Rather, they were brought over from Europe by early colonizers in the 1500s. These colonizers had several reasons for bringing hogs to America. One of the primary reasons was for food. Hogs were a valuable source of protein that could be raised relatively easily and provide a sustainable source of meat for the colonizers. In addition, hogs were known for their adaptability to new environments and ability to forage for food, making them a valuable resource for early settlers. Hogs were also used for hunting purposes, as they were often released into the wild to breed and establish populations that could later be hunted for sport. Today, wild hogs can be found in almost every state in the U.S., with Texas having the largest population. There are currently an estimated 6 million wild hogs in the United States, with over 2.6 million wild hogs in Texas alone. These animals have adapted to their new environment and can thrive in a variety of habitats, from forests to marshes. Wild hogs, also known as feral pigs, are a menace to many. They cause damage to crops, spread diseases, and can even pose a threat to humans and other animals. Attempts have been made to control their population over the years, from trapping and hunting to aerial gunning, but to no avail. These highly adaptable creatures can survive in a variety of environments, from forests and grasslands to wetlands. As omnivores, they will feed on a wide range of food sources, including plants, insects, small animals, and carrion. Their keen sense of smell and nighttime activity make them efficient foragers, using their strong snouts to root through the ground and locate food. Hogs play a significant role in the food chain, both as prey and predator. They are a primary food source for many large carnivores such as wolves, bears, and big cats. But they are also opportunistic predators themselves, hunting small animals such as insects, rodents, and reptiles. Wild boars, the male counterpart of wild sows, will roam their territory looking for females in heat. Once a wild boar finds a receptive sow, he will inseminate her with his semen. After the wild sow becomes pregnant, she will seek out a safe and secure area to give birth to her litter of piglets. Unlike domesticated hogs, wild sows will often leave their litter of piglets to forage for food, returning to nurse them periodically. This allows the sow to feed herself and ensure the survival of the litter. Once the piglets are weaned, they will join their mother and other members of the sounder, the group of hogs, in foraging for food and seeking shelter from predators. Sounders can range in size from a few individuals to over 20 individuals, with females and their offspring typically forming the core of the group. Male wild boars are typically solitary, but may join a sounder during the breeding season. Understanding the behavior and social structure of wild hogs is essential to managing their population effectively. Despite numerous attempts to control their numbers, the resilience and adaptability of these creatures continue to pose a significant challenge to those seeking to manage their population. As the population of wild hogs has grown, so has the need for domesticated hogs for meat production. Today, hog farming is a major industry in the United States, with millions of hogs raised each year. However, breeding hogs for commercial purposes is a complex process that requires careful attention to genetics, nutrition, and animal welfare. So, let's explore how hog breeding has evolved over time to meet the demands of the market. Domesticated hogs are bred under controlled conditions, and their breeding practices are different from wild hogs. Domesticated hogs are raised for their meat and are often bred for specific characteristics that are desirable for meat production such as size, growth rate, and meat quality. In contrast to wild hogs, which mate naturally in the wild, domesticated hogs are often bred through artificial insemination or selective breeding. Artificial insemination allows breeders to control the genetics of the offspring and can help to produce healthier and more productive pigs. Selective breeding involves choosing the best animals to breed based on certain traits, such as meat quality or size with the goal of improving the overall quality of the herd. Domesticated hogs generally have higher litter sizes than wild hogs, 
On average, a sow can produce a litter of 8 to 12 piglets, but some well-managed breeding programs can result in even higher litter sizes. Hogs play a significant role in the ecosystem as both wild and domesticated animals. In the wild, they are considered to be ecosystem engineers, meaning that they significantly alter their environment to the benefit of other species. For example, hogs root in the soil for food, which helps to increase soil aeration, turnover, and nutrient availability. This can be beneficial for other plant species and even for soil-dwelling animals. However, when wild hogs are introduced to non-native environments, they can cause significant ecological damage. As such, their presence in the United States has had significant negative impacts. Wild boars cause over $2 billion in damage to crops and property each year, with damage to agricultural crops accounting for approximately $1.5 billion of that total. In some areas, such as Texas, wild boars have been estimated to cause over 50% damage to crops like corn and soybeans. These voracious animals have a seemingly insatiable appetite and can quickly devastate fields of corn, soybeans, wheat, and other crops. They root up the soil, damaging the root systems of plants and making it difficult for crops to grow. Additionally, they trample and consume crops, leaving behind a trail of destruction that can take years to recover from. Hogs can also damage irrigation systems, which can cause water to be distributed unevenly or lead to leaks that waste water. Moreover, their rooting and wallowing behavior can cause soil erosion, which can lead to sediment runoff and water pollution. All of these factors can have a negative impact on the environment and the surrounding ecosystems, and ultimately affect the availability and quality of food produced. The issue of wild hog overpopulation in the United States has prompted action from various government agencies and organizations. One approach taken by some states has been to allow hunting and trapping of wild boars. This approach has been effective in reducing wild boar populations in some areas, but it can also be challenging due to the animal's intelligence, adaptability, and nocturnal behavior. Hunters and trappers must be skilled and experienced to successfully catch wild boars, and they may need specialized equipment such as traps and dogs trained to track and hold wild hogs. Many states require hunters to report their wild boar harvest to track population trends and determine the effectiveness of hunting and trapping efforts. Fencing is another commonly used method to prevent wild boars from accessing agricultural areas. High tensile electric fencing is the most effective type of fencing for this purpose, as it is able to withstand the strength of wild boars. The height and strength of the fence are important factors in determining its effectiveness, as wild boars are strong and can jump over low fences. Therefore, fences should be at least three feet high and made of sturdy materials. It is also worth noting that wild boars carry and spread diseases that can be transmitted to domestic livestock and even humans. One such disease is swine fever that can cause severe illness in domestic pigs and has led to devastating outbreaks in various parts of the world. The spread of these diseases is a major concern for farmers and public health officials as it can lead to significant economic losses and public health risks. Therefore, it is important to take measures to control the wild boar population and prevent the spread of these diseases. Some states have implemented programs to control wild boar populations through fertility control methods. This involves administering contraceptive agents to female wild hogs to prevent reproduction, which can help reduce populations over time. However, this approach can be difficult to implement on a large scale as it requires capturing and treating individual animals and may not be effective in areas with large and dispersed populations. As we come to the end of our journey exploring the wild hog, one thing is clear. There is no one-size-fits-all solution to the wild hog problem in the United States. But a combination of approaches may help manage and reduce wild boar populations and mitigate the damage they cause to crops, native wildlife, and public health. These animals have proven to be incredibly resilient and adaptable in the face of changing environments and human activity. Whether we view them as a valuable resource or a pest, there is no denying that these animals have left an indelible mark on the landscape of America.
The fishing industry has long been a significant driver of Canada's economy, contributing billions of dollars in revenue each year. At the forefront of this industry is the lobster sector, generating an estimated worth of over $484 million, a large portion of which comes from exporting lobsters worldwide. This succulent crustacean is not only an integral part of Canadian cuisine, but has also gained an international reputation, becoming a highly sought-after commodity. Its rich taste and tender texture have made it one of the most valuable catches in Canada, contributing billions of dollars to the economy each year. In 2021 alone, Canada exported 95.5 million kilograms of lobsters, worth over $2 billion CAD with the United States being the largest market, importing nearly 80% of all exported lobsters. But it's not just the U.S. Countries like China, Japan, and South Korea are also major fans, importing significant quantities of lobsters every year. As we explore the fascinating world of Canadian lobster fishing, one question looms large. Just how do the Canadian fish farmers reel in enough lobsters to generate a whopping $484 million in revenue each year? Lobster fishing has been a part of Canadian history and culture for centuries, dating back to the early days of European settlement. The first documented catch of lobsters in Canada was in the 1600s, and it is believed that indigenous peoples in the region were catching lobsters long before that. Today, lobster fishing remains a vital industry in Canada, particularly in the Atlantic provinces. The three main provinces where Canadian fishermen catch lobsters are Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick, which together account for the majority of the country's lobster catches. In these provinces, lobster fishing typically takes place between late fall and early spring, as this is when lobsters are most abundant and of the highest quality. Despite the value of the Canadian lobster industry, lobsters are not typically farmed in aquaculture operations like certain other fish species. This is because lobsters require very specific conditions to thrive, including clean water, appropriate temperatures, and access to the right type of food. Although attempts have been made to farm lobsters, the challenges associated with reproducing their natural habitat in captivity have made it difficult to do so on a large scale. Additionally, the unique flavor and texture of wild-caught lobsters, which is largely a result of their natural habitat and diet, make them highly valued by consumers and preferred over farmed lobsters, which can be more uniform in flavor and texture. Setting up custom-made, wire mesh lobster traps is the first step in the lobster harvesting process. The lobsters are captured in these traps while water may still travel through. It is truly remarkable how carefully these traps are designed to avoid harming the lobsters or the ecosystem of the sea. The lobsters may enter and exit the traps without incurring major harm or endangering the ecosystem. The benefits, however, go beyond that. By building the traps correctly, fishermen can reduce the likelihood of bycatch or the unintended capture of species other than those that were intended. This is especially important given the precarious status of many marine ecosystems throughout the world. This method is, thus, a delicate balance between meeting the demand for these delectable crustaceans and protecting the marine ecosystem for future generations. Once set, the traps are left in the water for up to 48 hours. Fishermen keep a watchful eye to make sure everything is running smoothly. Losing or damaging a trap is a costly mistake for the fishermen and a potential threat to the marine ecosystem. After spending between 24 and 48 hours in the traps, the lobsters are finally retrieved from the water and transported to shore. This is where the real work begins. To ensure that the lobsters remain alive and healthy during transport, specialized boats are used. These boats are equipped with tanks or holding areas that are filled with chilled seawater to maintain the lobster's appropriate temperature. The tanks may also have aeration systems to make sure that the water is properly oxygenated, creating a comfortable and healthy environment for the lobsters. It is important to note that lobsters are highly valued for their meat, and their flavor and texture are best when they are alive and fresh. When a lobster dies, the meat begins to decompose rapidly, affecting both its taste and texture. It is therefore crucial for lobsters to remain alive until they are sold and cooked to ensure the best possible taste and texture for consumers. Additionally, keeping lobsters alive until they are sold ensures that customers are getting the freshest product possible.
which is an important factor for many seafood consumers. Once the lobsters reach the shore, they go through a sorting process based on size and weight, which is essential for a sustainable fishery. Only lobsters that meet the minimum size requirements are kept for sale, while smaller ones are carefully returned to the water. The minimum size requirements for lobsters vary depending on the region and the specific regulations in place. In general, these regulations are designed to ensure that only mature lobsters are harvested and that smaller lobsters are allowed to grow and contribute to the overall health of the population. In Canada, for example, the minimum legal size for a lobster is typically around 72 millimeters, 2.83 inches in carapace length. However, these regulations can change from year to year depending on the state of the lobster population and other factors. To keep track of the lobsters during transport and sorting, fishermen use a variety of methods. In some cases, each lobster may be tagged or marked in some way so that it can be identified later. This can be done using a variety of techniques, including physical tags or markings, electronic tagging, or even using different colors of dye to mark the lobsters. In other cases, Fishermen may simply rely on their own experience and knowledge of the lobsters to sort them quickly and efficiently. Experienced fishermen can often assess the size and weight of a lobster with just a quick glance, allowing them to sort large volumes of lobsters in a short amount of time. Once the lobsters have been sorted, they are placed in holding tanks filled with seawater until they are ready for transport. Canada is known for producing some of the highest quality lobsters in the world, and the industry takes great care to ensure that this reputation is maintained. In fact, the Canadian lobster industry has a well-established certification program called the Marine Stewardship Council Certification. This program recognizes fisheries that are committed to sustainable fishing practices and ensuring that their products are of high quality. By meeting the strict standards of the MSC, Canadian lobster fishermen can ensure that their catch is not only sustainable, but also meets the highest quality standards. The lobster industry in Canada not only serves as a source of revenue, but also a source of employment for many Canadians. With an estimated 50,000 individuals working in the industry across the country, the jobs provided by the industry are crucial for many rural communities in Canada. These jobs offer stable employment opportunities and often provide competitive wages. In fact, according to the Fisheries Council of Canada, the average salary for a lobster fisherman in Canada is around $65,000 per year, making it a well-paying occupation. Despite the many economic benefits of the lobster industry, there are concerns about its environmental impact. Overfishing and the destruction of lobster habitats have led to declines in lobster populations in some areas. To combat these concerns, Canadian fish farmers are implementing sustainable fishing practices and supporting habitat restoration efforts. Additionally, many fish farmers participate in lobster hatchery programs to ensure a stable supply of juvenile lobsters. In conclusion, the Canadian lobster industry is a vital sector of the country's economy, providing employment for thousands of people and contributing billions of dollars annually. The industry's success is a result of the efficient and sustainable harvesting methods used by Canadian fishers, as well as their commitment to maintaining the highest standards of quality. While environmental concerns continue to be a challenge, the industry's future is bright with the continued implementation of sustainable practices and habitat restoration initiatives. With these efforts, the Canadian lobster industry can continue to thrive for generations to come. Beekeeping, a practice with ancient origins dating back thousands of years, plays a pivotal role in our ecosystems and agriculture. In Europe alone, there are over 17.5 million managed honeybee hives, underscoring the continent's significance in the global beekeeping landscape. These millions of hives contribute to an estimated annual honey production of over 200,000 tons, highlighting the substantial economic impact of this age-old practice. Europe's diverse climates and rich flora foster a unique tapestry of beekeeping traditions, where the number of hives and the scale of production vary markedly across different regions. This video delves deep into the heart of European apiculture, unraveling the complex and number-driven world of beekeeping, where millions of honeybees are not only nurtured and harvested, but also formed the backbone of ecological balance and agricultural productivity. Beekeeping in Europe has deep historical roots. Initially, beekeeping began as a small-scale practice for harvesting honey and beeswax, primarily for food and candle making. 
Historical records suggest that in medieval Europe, the number of hives significantly expanded, with monasteries playing a pivotal role. These religious institutions not only increased hive numbers, but also became centers of beekeeping knowledge and innovation. By the late medieval period, it is estimated that larger monasteries managed dozens of hives each, significantly contributing to the understanding of bee biology. This rich history is manifested in today's European landscape where traditional beehives in rural areas stand as a testament to a practice that has evolved and expanded over centuries. As Europe transitioned through the Renaissance and into the Industrial Revolution, beekeeping underwent significant transformations. One of the most revolutionary innovations was the introduction of the movable frame hive in the 19th century. This innovation alone led to a substantial increase in honey yields. For example, Average honey production per hive increased by over 50% in the decades following its adoption. The movable frame design also allowed the healthier bee colonies by facilitating better disease management and hive inspection processes. Statistical data from the late 19th century show a marked decrease in colony losses, with some regions reporting up to a 30% reduction in annual hive mortality rates. These technological advancements mirrored broader changes in agricultural practices and societal needs, propelling beekeeping into a more efficient and scalable practice. By the early 20th century, the number of hives in Europe had grown significantly, with estimates indicating a growth of up to 70% in certain countries, largely attributable to these innovations. Currently, Europe is home to approximately 17.5 million beehives, a number that reflects both the enduring legacy and the evolving nature of the practice. Modern European beekeeping is not just surviving, it's innovating. The adoption of technological advancements such as automated honey extractors and computerized hive monitoring systems has increased efficiency and productivity. For instance, automated systems have been shown to increase honey extraction rates by up to 30%, while advanced monitoring has reduced labor costs and improved colony health surveillance. Today's European beekeepers are increasingly adopting sustainable practices, such as organic beekeeping, which has grown by approximately 20% in the last five years. These sustainable practices are crucial, not only for the health of bee populations, but also for the environment, contributing to ecological balance and biodiversity conservation. Beekeeping in Europe exhibits remarkable diversity, mirrored in the numbers that characterize each region's practice. In the warm Mediterranean climates of Spain and Italy, Beekeeping thrives due to favorable conditions. Spain boasts over 2.5 million hives, contributing significantly to Europe's honey production with renowned multifloral and rosemary honeys. Italian beekeepers, managing more than a million hives, specialize in artisanal honey varieties such as acacia and chestnut. In contrast, Northern European countries like Germany and the United Kingdom, home to approximately 870,000 and 247,000 hives respectively, adapt their beekeeping techniques to cooler climates. These regions collectively house around 9 billion bees, emphasizing the scale of beekeeping efforts required for hive survival and productivity in colder environments. German beekeepers are known for their precision and efficiency, a necessity given the challenging climate, while British apiarists focus on preserving native bee species, a critical factor in maintaining regional biodiversity. Eastern European countries like Poland and Hungary showcase a fusion of traditional and modern beekeeping practices. Poland, with around 1.5 million hives and managing approximately 40 million bees, is celebrated for its forest and heather honeys. Hungary, harboring about 760,000 hives, is distinguished for its production of acacia honey, leveraging the extensive acacia forests that dot the country. In the harsher climates of Scandinavia, countries like Sweden, despite challenges, have developed robust beekeeping systems. Sweden's approximately 97,000 hives, tending to nearly 4 million bees, often use advanced insulation methods like polystyrene hives, a testament to the innovation required for beekeeping in colder regions. Each of these areas, with their specific hive and bee counts, not only contributes significantly to Europe's beekeeping mosaic, but it also underlines the importance of regional adaptation in maintaining the health and productivity of bee populations. In analyzing the ecological impact of honeybees, the numbers speak volumes. Honeybees are responsible for the pollination of approximately 80% of all flowering plants, including over 70 of the top 100 human food crops, which supply about 90% of the world's nutrition. In Europe, bees play a crucial role in the agricultural sector, contributing significantly to the economy. 
Studies estimate that the economic value of bee pollination in Europe amounts to billions of euros annually, underlining their critical role in food production and security. This vital pollination service ensures the successful reproduction of a wide range of plants, essential not only for human nutrition, but also for maintaining biodiversity. In terms of ecosystem services, the role of bees extends far beyond pollination. Their activities support the growth of wild plant communities, which in turn provide habitats for diverse wildlife species. European beekeepers today confront a myriad of challenges, quantifiable in their impact and demanding in their scope. One of the most pressing issues is the loss of hives due to pests, particularly the Varroa mite. Statistical studies indicate that untreated hives can experience up to a 90% collapse rate due to this pest. The economic repercussions are significant. The European honey market, valued at over 600 million euros, faces potential annual revenue losses in the tens of millions due to these declines. Climate change presents another formidable challenge, with erratic weather patterns influencing honey production and bee health, resulting in up to a 15 to 20 percent decrease in honey yields in certain regions. This ecological imbalance not only affects honey production, but also disrupts pollination services, vital for crops that contribute to the EU's agricultural output, valued at hundreds of billions of euros. Beekeepers are thus compelled to adapt their practices, invest in mitigation strategies, and collaborate with scientific communities, incurring additional costs and labor, all in an effort to sustain their hives and the critical role they play in Europe's agriculture and ecosystems. Economic pressures also impact beekeeping in Europe. The competition from cheaper honey imports and counterfeit products has placed financial strain on local beekeepers, with some regions reporting up to a 25% decrease in market prices over the past decade. As we look towards the future of European beekeeping, current trends and statistical forecasts paint an intriguing picture. Emerging technologies in precision beekeeping, such as sensor-based hive monitoring, are predicted to significantly increase colony health monitoring efficiency, potentially reducing colony losses by up to 20%. The rise of urban beekeeping is also noteworthy, with the number of city-based hives expected to grow by 15% annually, integrating nature into urban settings. Meanwhile, sustainable practices like organic beekeeping are gaining momentum, with a projected increase of 30% in organic certified bee farms over the next decade. This shift underscores a growing market demand, where organic honey production is estimated to see a revenue increase of 25% in the coming years. These evolving trends, coupled with ongoing research indicating a potential 10% improvement in pollination efficiency through advanced beekeeping methods, suggest a future where European beekeeping not only thrives, but also plays a pivotal role in agricultural sustainability and biodiversity conservation. This documentary, by showcasing these quantitative aspects, underscores our interconnectedness with nature and highlights the crucial role of informed, data-driven practices in preserving the delicate balance of our ecosystem. In summary, European beekeeping scale and impact are highlighted by striking statistics. Spain's 2.5 million hives, Italy's over a million, Germany's 870,000, and the UK's 247,000 showcase the industry's vastness. These countries, along with others, collectively manage billions of bees, crucial for pollination and biodiversity. Despite challenges like the Varroa mite and climate change, advancements in technology and a growing focus on sustainability are shaping the future of beekeeping. This blend of tradition and innovation, underpinned by significant numbers, underscores beekeeping's vital role in Europe's ecological, agricultural, and cultural tapestry. The story of the American bison, an iconic symbol of the Northern American wilderness, is a tale best told through numbers. Once the lords of the North American Great Plains, bison numbers were staggering in their abundance. Historical estimates suggest that there were between 30 to 60 million bison roaming freely across the continent in the 18th century. Unfortunately, the bison faced near extinction in the late 19th century with their numbers dwindling to a precarious few hundred. Today, through concerted conservation efforts, the bison population has made a significant comeback, with approximately 100,000 individuals thriving in conservation herds across North America. The story of the bison's decline is a poignant example of how quickly and drastically human actions can affect wildlife populations and ecosystems. 
It sets the stage for understanding the significance of the bison's subsequent comeback and the efforts that were crucial in making this a reality. In the 19th century, the arrival of European settlers initiated a series of events that drastically altered the landscape and fate of the bison. The expansion of European settlements brought not only people, but also the railroad, a symbol of progress that paradoxically spelled doom for the bison. The Transcontinental Railroad, completed in the late 19th century, bisected the Great Plains, fragmenting the vast roaming grounds of the bison and disrupting their natural migratory patterns. As the railroad expanded, it facilitated easier access to the Great Plains for hunters. Bison hunting, once a sustainable practice by indigenous tribes, turned into a large-scale commercial enterprise. The U.S. government, in its efforts to control and relocate indigenous tribes, recognized the dependence of these tribes on bison. Policies were implemented that intentionally targeted bison herds to undermine the tribe's traditional way of life forcing them into dependency on government aid and relocation to reservations. This strategy was part of a broader effort to open the West for settlement and to suppress the native population. The decimation of bison herds was both a consequence and a tool of this colonial expansion. By the late 1800s, the relentless hunting had its toll, decimating the bison population to the brink of extinction. With numbers dwindling to less than a thousand, this resulted in a decline rate that is among the most severe recorded for any species in modern history. The early 1900s marked the beginning of a remarkable turnaround. Spearheaded by conservationists, ranchers, and government entities, the first significant step was the establishment of the National Bison Range in 1908. This initiative provided a sanctuary for the remaining bison and became a cornerstone in their path to recovery. Around the same time, the American Bison Society, founded in 1905, began its mission to save the species from the brink of extinction. By the 1930s, these efforts started to bear fruit, with the bison numbers slowly but steadily growing. From a few hundred, the numbers rose to several thousand, signaling a hopeful future for the species. The post-World War II era ushered in a new phase in bison conservation. The focus expanded from purely conservation-led efforts to include private ranching. This shift was significant as it brought a new dimension to bison population growth. By the 1960s and 1970s, private herds began contributing significantly to the overall bison population, a trend that continues today. The 1990s witnessed another notable surge in the bison population. Driven by increased public interest and the burgeoning commercial viability of bison ranching, this era saw the population reach around 30,000 by the end of the 20th century, a remarkable recovery from their near extinction just a century earlier. The establishment of the Intertribal Bison Cooperative in 1990 was a significant milestone, marking a confluence of conservation efforts and cultural restoration for Native American communities. Comprising 57 tribes, the cooperative not only bolstered bison numbers, but also reconnected indigenous communities with an integral part of their heritage. As of the latest data, the bison population in North America stands at over 500,000, with around 20,000 in conservation herds and the majority in private herds. The largest publicly managed herd resides in Yellowstone National Park with over 4,000 bison. Other significant conservation herds are found in national parks and reserves across the United States and Canada, such as the Wood Buffalo National Park in Alberta, Canada, with around 5,000 bison, and the National Bison Range in Montana, housing about 350 bison. The geographical distribution of bison herds is closely tied to environmental factors and land availability. Private herds, which account for the majority of the bison population, are spread across various ranches in North America. The size of these herds vary considerably, with some ranches like Ted Turner's ranches in the United States having over 50,000 bison across various properties. These private herds are primarily raised for bison meat, which has seen a surge in demand due to its health benefits and sustainable farming practices. While public herds are managed primarily for conservation and ecological purposes, private herds are often focused on commercial utilization. In the landscape of North American agriculture, bison farming has carved out a significant niche, transforming from a historically marginalized industry to a burgeoning economic powerhouse. When delving into bison meat production, 
The numbers speak volumes about the industry's upward trajectory. Annually, more than 35,000 bison are processed for meat in the United States. Bison meat, known for being leaner and higher in protein than beef, commands a premium price. Consumers willingly pay around $10 per pound for ground bison, compared to the $5 to $6 for its beef counterpart, driven by its perceived health benefits and quality. The economic value of bison farming can no longer be overlooked. With the market for bison meat now estimated at over $280 million annually, the industry's growth has stimulated interest in export markets, particularly in Europe, where the appetite for quality bison meat is on the rise. The comparison of bison farming with traditional cattle rearing reveals some stark contrasts. Bison, being hardy and resilient, require fewer resources like feed and veterinary care, adapting more naturally to harsh weather conditions and resisting diseases. This lower maintenance, however, comes with a trade-off in growth rates, as bison tend to grow slower than cattle, reflected in their higher feed conversion ratios. The ecological impact of bison in North America is profound and multifaceted. When they roamed the vast grasslands, these majestic animals played a critical role in shaping the ecology of the continent. As engineers of their environment, bison's grazing habits fostered diverse and robust prairies, their preference for certain grasses and the way they trample the soil aid in seed dispersal and growth of native plants, which in turn supports a diverse range of wildlife. Studies have shown that areas grazed by bison exhibit a higher biodiversity than those grazed by other livestock, underlining their unique role in ecosystem management. Despite their benefits, the full ecological potential of bison remains partially untapped due to their reduced numbers and confined ranges. The current herds occupying a fraction of their historical range hint at the vast ecological contributions they could make if their populations and habitats were restored more extensively. In the modern context, bison reintroduction projects are not just about increasing numbers. They symbolize a larger effort to restore ecological processes that have been disrupted. As the bison herds grow and reclaim their old roaming grounds, the hope is that they will once again become the architects of a thriving and resilient ecosystem. Yet, this journey is not without its challenges. One of the most pressing issues is genetic diversity. As the bison population plummeted in the 19th century, so did its genetic variety. Today's herds, largely descendants of a small ancestral pool, face the risks associated with reduced genetic diversity including vulnerability to diseases and environmental changes. Another significant challenge is habitat loss. Modern land use, from agriculture to urban development, has drastically reduced the available open spaces. Ensuring enough habitat for bison not only to live, but to thrive, is a complex task involving negotiations with landowners, policy changes, and often public opinion battles. In conclusion, the future of the North American bison while promising, requires a delicate balance of conservation, sustainable management, and economic viability. It's a testament to the power of collective effort in wildlife conservation, symbolizing a hope that extends beyond the prairies where these majestic creatures roam. As we look ahead, the story of the bison is not just about numbers and statistics. It's about our relationship with the natural world and the legacy we choose to create. In the heart of Norway lies a pivotal sector of the global seafood industry, salmon farming. Norwegian fisheries, celebrated for their efficiency, have mastered the art of raising over 30 million salmon annually. These efforts contribute significantly to Norway's economy, with the salmon farming sector making up a substantial portion of the country's seafood exports. As of 2022, the total export value of Atlantic salmon from Norway amounted to $11.2 billion. The story of Norwegian salmon farming is one of impressive numbers, showcasing a journey from humble beginnings to a position of global leadership in seafood production. In the serene fjords of Norway, the 1970s marked a pivotal turn in the country's maritime history with the inception of salmon farming. This transformative period began when Norwegian fishermen grappling with the decline of wild salmon stocks embarked on a journey towards sustainable aquaculture. Initially, their efforts were modest, employing rudimentary floating cages and experimenting with breeding techniques. 
As the industry took root, it experienced exponential growth. By the early 1980s, what started as a collection of small-scale operations had burgeoned into a major sector of the Norwegian economy. Production volumes, a mere few thousand tons in the late 1970s, skyrocketed to over 100,000 tons by the end of the decade. The industry's impact was not just domestic. By the mid-1980s, Norway had begun to assert itself as a key player on the global stage, with exports of farmed salmon reaching markets far and wide. The value of these exports mirrored the industry's physical growth, multiplying several times over in just a few years. This surge in export value highlighted not only the increasing demand for salmon worldwide, but also the growing recognition of Norway's expertise and innovation in sustainable aquaculture practices. Norwegian salmon farming's early days were characterized by a blend of traditional fishing knowledge and a willingness to adopt new technologies and methods. This blend proved crucial in overcoming the initial challenges of cultivating salmon in captivity. As the Norwegian salmon farming industry grew, it embraced a wave of technological innovations that significantly enhanced its efficiency and production capabilities. In the early stages, manual methods dominated, but the introduction of automated feeding systems marked a revolutionary shift. These systems allowed for precise control of feed quantities, leading to a reduction in feed cost by approximately 15%, while simultaneously improving the growth rates of salmon. Advanced breeding programs were also initiated, leveraging genetic insights to enhance the resilience and health of the salmon stock. As a result, survival rates from egg to harvest improved by over 20%, a testament to the industry's commitment to sustainable growth. In the fjords where these farms are nestled, the integration of modern technology continued to redefine aquaculture practices. Norwegian farmers began employing sophisticated monitoring systems, using sensors and underwater cameras to keep an eye on the health and behavior of the salmon. This data-driven approach was pivotal in maintaining optimal living conditions within the pens. The ability to monitor water quality and temperature in real time led to a more responsive and adaptive farming environment, ensuring the well-being of the salmon and enhancing their growth environment. Such advancements have not only bolstered the efficiency of the operations, but have also played a crucial role in minimizing the ecological footprint of the farms. Central to the operation's success was the continual refinement of these technological systems. Innovations like underwater drones and AI-driven monitoring have become the industry's backbone, providing real-time insights into pain conditions and fish health. The precision of these tools allows farmers to adjust feeding schedules and densities, ensuring the best possible growth conditions. This level of control and efficiency has set a new standard in the aquaculture industry, solidifying Norway's position as a leader in sustainable salmon farming practices. The impact of these technological advancements is clear, a marked increase in annual production, with the industry now capable of producing over 30 million salmon each year, while maintaining a steadfast commitment to environmental stewardship and the highest standards of fish welfare. The life cycle of these fish is meticulously managed from the very first stage. Annually, millions of eggs are incubated under conditions that meticulously mimic nature, ensuring optimal temperature and water quality. During their early life, the fry are nurtured in these hatcheries until they reach the smolt stage, typically around 12 to 18 months old. It is at this stage they are ready for the significant transition to the saltwater environment of the open pens. The number of smolts transferred annually runs into tens of millions. Once settled in the open pens, strategically placed in the deep fjords, the salmon entered the growth phase of their life cycle. Here, they spend up to two years growing from smolts to fully matured fish ready for harvest. During this period, their weight increases exponentially, often reaching up to five to six kilograms. But Norwegian salmon farming faces significant challenges that necessitate innovative solutions. A primary concern is disease control. In response, Norwegian fisheries have adopted stringent health monitoring systems and widespread vaccinations, leading to a dramatic reduction in antibiotic use by up to 90% in the past decade. This proactive approach has not only improved the overall health of the salmon, but also minimized the environmental impact of pharmaceuticals in marine ecosystems. Another critical issue is sea lice, parasites that attach to salmon, harming their health. Norway has pioneered non-chemical methods to tackle this. 
Techniques like using cleaner fish, which naturally feed on these parasites, have been effective, reducing sea lice infestations by as much as 60%. Escapees are also a point of concern. Farm-raised salmon escaping into the wild can potentially disrupt local ecosystems. To prevent this, the industry has strengthened pen structures and introduced rigorous monitoring, resulting in a decrease in escape incidents by over 50% in recent years. Central to the environmental balance is the impact of fish farming on local marine ecosystems. Norway has taken strides in addressing issues like waste management and feed sustainability. The feed, once heavily reliant on wild fish, now increasingly incorporates plant-based and alternative proteins, reducing the reliance on ocean fish stocks by 30%. As global demand for seafood rises, Norway's commitment to sustainable practices in salmon farming serves as a model, striving not just for economic gain, but for harmony with nature. The industry has achieved a remarkable balance. This balance is vital in maintaining the health of both the salmon and the marine ecosystem, ensuring the industry's sustainability and resilience in the face of environmental challenges. In the picturesque coastal towns of Norway, the salmon industry has become synonymous with employment and community sustenance. In areas where job opportunities are often limited, salmon farming offers a vital source of livelihood. The industry has created thousands of jobs, not just in direct farming activities, but also in ancillary sectors. It's common to find entire families whose lives and livelihoods are intertwined with the salmon farming industry, underscoring its significance in local community life. In essence, the economic and social impact of Norwegian salmon farming is profound. This industry transcends its primary function of food production, playing a pivotal role in sustaining local communities and fueling Norway's economy. Its influence is felt not just nationally, but also on a global scale, echoing Norway's commitment to not only economic growth, but also to sustainable and responsible aquaculture practices. In conclusion, Norway's journey in salmon farming, marked by impressive numbers and innovation, paints a future of continued growth and sustainability. Projections suggest increasing production efficiency, advancements in eco-friendly technologies, and significant economic contributions maintaining Norway's leading role in global seafood supply while upholding its commitment to environmental harmony. Alpacas, with their serene demeanor and valuable fleece, have become a quiet yet significant part of American farming. Originating from the Andean highlands, alpacas found a new home in the U.S. several decades ago. As of the latest data, the U.S. boasts over 4,000 alpaca farms, nurturing a population that exceeds 200,000. These farms are dedicated to raising alpacas, not just for their charismatic presence, but for their valuable fleece. These numbers are not just a testament to the growing interest in alpaca farming, but also highlight the burgeoning role of these animals in the American textile industry. Each year, these alpacas collectively produce a remarkable volume of fleece, known for its softness and thermal properties, contributing significantly to the niche but flourishing market of luxury fibers. This video delves into the journey of these alpacas, unveiling their impact on the farming practices, economies, and the American agricultural narrative. The journey of alpacas in American farming began over two decades ago, marking a transition from exotic novelty to a staple in the textile industry. These charismatic creatures, native to the mountainous regions of South America, first set hoof on U.S. soil in the mid-1980s. Initially, their limited presence was a mere curiosity among the broader farming community. Initial records show that only a handful of farms, less than 100 nationwide, ventured into alpaca farming, nurturing a population that barely exceeded a few thousand. However, the potential of alpacas in high-quality fiber production quickly caught the attention of American farmers. By the turn of the millennium, the industry saw a significant upswing. The number of alpaca farms burgeoned to over 500, housing tens of thousands of these Indian natives. This growth was not just in numbers, but also in the sophistication of breeding and wool production techniques. As of the latest data, this upward trajectory has continued impressively, from a few thousand pounds of wool in the early years to hundreds of thousands of pounds now. The alpaca's journey mirrors an industry's evolution, adapting and thriving in a new land. On the sprawling landscapes of American farms, a data-driven approach underpins every aspect of the care of tens of thousands of breeding alpacas. Breeding programs are not just about maintaining genetic diversity, 
but also about boosting population numbers effectively. Annually, these programs contribute to a robust birth rate, with survival rates impressively high. In fact, the survival rate of newborn alpacas on these farms often exceeds 90%, a testament to the rigorous attention given to their well-being. The dietary regime of alpacas is a carefully balanced equation of nutrition and palatability. Each alpaca consumes an average of two to three pounds of feed daily, primarily consisting of high-quality hay and grass. This diet is supplemented with grains and minerals, ensuring they receive all the necessary nutrients. This carefully calibrated diet plays a pivotal role not only in maintaining their health, but also in enhancing the quality of their wool. The maintenance practices are equally data-driven, with regular shearing scheduled every 12 to 18 months to prevent overheating and ensure comfort. Furthermore, routine toenail trims and dental checks are conducted to prevent overgrowth and alignment issues, critical for the alpaca's overall health. Healthcare on these farms is another area where numbers speak volumes. Routine veterinary visits ensure that over 95% of the herd is in optimal health, a statistic that directly influences productivity. On these farms, there's a keen focus on preventative care to minimize illness. Parasite control measures, integral to maintaining herd health, are implemented with a success rate of over 98%. The result of these quantifiable strategies is a thriving alpaca population. Alpaca shearing in the United States is not just a crucial farming practice, but also a significant event in the annual agricultural calendar, marked by its impressive numbers and meticulous planning. Each year, as spring heralds the shearing season, American alpaca farms buzz with activity, undertaking the task of harvesting wool from their herds. On average, an alpaca yields between 5 to 10 pounds of wool annually. The process of shearing itself is a blend of skill and precision, often involving a team of experienced shearers. Each shearer is capable of handling about 5 to 10 alpacas per day. Depending on factors such as the animal's size and the wool's condition, the number of shearers on a farm can vary greatly. Smaller farms might employ just one or two, while larger operations require a team working in tandem over several days to manage their larger herds. This efficiency is crucial to meet the demands of the market and ensure the well-being of the alpacas, as prolonged shearing processes can cause stress to the animals. Once sheared, the wool enters a phase of sorting and grading. Each fleece is assessed for fineness, length, and color, determining its suitability for various end products. From luxurious garments to sturdy textiles, the fate of each fleece is decided in this meticulous process. Approximately 30% of the annual wool yield finds its way into the luxury clothing sector, transformed into elegant sweaters, scarves, and coats. Another 25% of the wool is channeled into the home textiles market. Here, it is utilized in the crafting of plush blankets, comfortable upholstery, and other domestic accessories. The remaining 45% of the wool, while not as prominently featured in mainstream markets, serves a critical role in diversifying the use of alpaca fiber. This portion is incorporated into outdoor clothing, leveraging the natural water-resistant and thermal properties of alpaca wool. Its utility in this sector underscores the practicality of the fiber extending beyond aesthetics to functional, durable clothing ideal for outdoor adventures. Additionally, a portion of this segment is dedicated to producing industrial-grade materials, including rugs and other durable goods, where the coarser grades of alpaca wool are put to excellent use. This strategic distribution of alpaca wool not only demonstrates its multifaceted applications, but also reflects the careful market planning by American farmers and textile industries. They ensure that every ounce of wool is optimally utilized, catering to a wide array of consumer needs, from high fashion to practical everyday use. Such an approach underlines the efficiency and economic savvy inherent in the American alpaca industry turning the yearly production of millions of pounds of alpaca wool into a spectrum of valuable, sought-after products. Current estimates place the market value at approximately $50 million annually. While the United States stands as a notable producer, it also actively participates in international commerce to balance its own market demands. Each year, significant quantities of raw alpaca fiber are imported, primarily from Peru, the global heartland of alpacas, supplementing the domestic output. Conversely, American farms export a smaller yet steadily growing volume of alpaca wool, with Europe and Asia emerging as key markets. These trade activities not only harmonize the supply and demand within the domestic market, but also integrate the U.S. into the broader narrative of the global textile industry. Beyond trade, the ripple effect of alpaca farming extends to job creation and local economies, 
particularly in rural areas where these farms are typically located. Detailed analysis reveals that alpaca farming and its related industries inject millions of dollars into local economies. The number of jobs directly or indirectly linked to this sector is significant, spanning farming, processing, marketing, and retail. In essence, the economic story of American alpaca wool transcends mere numbers and trade figures. It represents a powerful example of how a niche agricultural sector can impact livelihoods and the economy at large while delivering a unique product to the market. As this industry continues to expand, it promises not only greater economic contributions, but also a richer, more diverse cultural and agricultural tapestry within the United States.